So yeah, uh, dear participants and all of uh, you who will be watching this, uh, this is Sumava Basu, uh, founder and president of the Council for Global Cooperation, uh, CGC. And uh, I would like to warmly welcome you all to our today's session. Our session for today, uh, we are again uh, back with another important book discussion. Today's discussion, we focus on a new book by Laura Robson, Human Capital, A History of Putting Refugees to Work. Human Capital was published exactly two months back by Verso Books in November 2023. Laura Robson in this extraordinary book presents a global history of humanitarianism uh, and refugee regime. Human capital surveys over a century of global policy spanning various regions and governments showing how global humanitarianism has always trans transformed refugees into cheap labor. The book illustrates how refugees have become victims of capitalism throughout history and even modern day. And before we start with our today's uh, event and hear the author and discuss discussants lead our discussion, for our viewers, I would like to briefly introduce the author and our today's featured speaker, Laura Robson. Professor Laura Robson is a historian of modern Middle East and international history, and also a scholar of global refugee and displacement studies. She's the William and Donna Oliver McCourtney Professor of History at Pennsylvania State University. She has uh, written extensively on the issues of refugees and minority rights, forced migration, ethnic cleansing, and the emergence of international legal regimes. She's a leading scholar in the field, and her work has appeared in many prominent scholarly journals of her field. Some of her outstanding monographs include The Politics of Mass Violence in the Middle East, States of Separation, Transfer, Partition, and the Making of the Modern Middle East, and Colonialism and Christianity in Mandate, Palestine. Professor Robson regularly lectures locally, nationally, and internationally on topics related to refugeedom and asylum, and her works have uh, been quoted by various national and international media outlets and NGOs. She is the co-founder and co-editor of statelesshistories.org, a digital humanities project forum, exploring the varied and uh, multifaceted experiences of statelessness in the modern era. It is a truly uh, great pleasure and honor to have you again in our book discussions, uh, and this time to welcome your fascinating new book, uh, Professor Robson. And it is equally an honor to have with us today, Professors uh, Fatma Muge Goshek and Robert Hayden as our distinguished panelist in the session, whom I would introduce a little later, and also Professor J. Winter, who would join me in steering the discussion during the discussion hour. So without further delays, I would now like to pass on the floor to our author today uh, for her opening remarks. Professor Robson, welcome back and the floor is yours. Thank you so very much for that kind introduction. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you to the Council for Global Cooperation for having me and for featuring this book. And I'm really, and to our other panelists, I very much appreciate your presence and your willingness to engage with this. Um, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. So I'll show you a few slides as we're going along, just to have some some add some visual interest um, to the proceedings. Um, so I started this book kind of by thinking about the story of refugee policy and particularly international refugee policy over the course of the 20th century. And part of the reason I did that is because refugee organizations have a story that they tell about their own origins. And it goes something like this. They say after the First World War that the League of Nations, which was driven by humanitarian motives and especially by the desire to assist the war's Russian and Armenian victims, tried, made an effort, but mostly failed to make refugee assistance a central part of their new peaceful world order. And after the Second World War, with its millions of displaced persons and the lingering specter of camps that were scattered across post-war Europe, the pressure was on for internationalists to kind of do this for real, get it right this time. And so human rights activists and concerned state actors worked together to write the 1951 Convention on Refugees, 
which was designed both to guarantee rights for Europe's displaced persons and to solve what was widely perceived as a post-war refugee crisis. Mm. Then, as decolonization unfolded and millions were displaced outside Europe, the international community saw the need to expand the convention's protections to the rest of the globe. So you can see here, this is the UNHCR's own account of its own history, and this is what it looks like. And this is a story that has had a remarkably long life, particularly in legal texts and in legal histories. But also, I would say it is still the most common understanding, public understanding of the history of the global refugee regime in our kind of public sphere. And as you can see, it does two things. It assumes, first of all, the existence of refugees as a kind of a priori, natural, forever phenomenon on the one hand, and it assumes the basic good intentions of the refugee regime on the other. So refugee studies as a field is relatively new. It's been going for, you know, maybe two to three decades, I would say. And there have been scholarly correctives to this narrative over those past decades. But even the most critical views of those fail to note generally a crucial aspect of the refugee regime's genesis, one that I think we can really only see from certain historical vantage points. And in particular, a view of the phenomena of displacement and resettlement that starts from the Middle East suggests a story that is not this story. It suggests that actually these refugee regimes had an older genesis and that they represented a careful recasting of 19th and early 20th century colonial ideas about using displaced people as laborers to build imperial territories and especially imperial economies. So I think that if we look from this angle, we will have a different view, not this view, a different view of exactly when and how and why these refugee regimes were developed and deployed in the first instance and how they continue to operate today. And that in essence is what this book is trying to do. So let me just kind of briefly outline the book's argument um, for our conversation. It begins in the Middle East where systematic transnational approaches to mass displacement long predated the Second World War and even predated the League of Nations. It was not anywhere in Europe, but rather the Ottoman imperial state that established the world's first governmental refugee regime, which they called the General Administrative Commission for Refugees, as the 19th century Balkan Wars from Greece to Bulgaria and along the Ottoman Russian border brought enormous numbers of people fleeing into Anatolia from the mid 19th century right through the second, the, the first world war. And from the beginning, Ottoman officials thought about this refugee flow in terms of making refugee labor serve their own state building interests. They mapped out regions in the Balkans and in Anatolia and in the Arab provinces where refugee workers could be placed to consolidate state power and kickstart the economic development of areas that they considered remote or difficult, which was in fact an idea that tracked with some kind of concurrently developing European schemes about settler colonial development in places like East Africa, including some Zionist varieties. So in point of fact, we actually have an origin for this refugee idea that is an Ottoman origin, not a European origin, certainly not a League origin, even further from being a Second World War origin, right? We can trace it back much further than we have normally thought. And the next step in this kind of process, which was a specifically internationalist experiment in turning refugees into labor migrants, built on this Ottoman model. It came in January of 1920 with the establishment of the new League of Nations. And the League of Nations very first high commissioner for refugees was a Norwegian diplomat named Friedhof Nansen, who had made a name for himself in his youth as a polar explorer, a detail that I think is not irrelevant here, right? He had his own kind of imperial background, his own imperial training that predated his participation in this refugee regime. And over the League's first years, Nansen's mandate expanded from a kind of initial responsibility for the two million Russians who had been displaced by that country's civil war to also include homeless Armenians, Assyrians, and Anatolian Greeks. Mm -hmm. And over the course of the early 1920s, 
facing, we must admit, a dearth of resources to deal with these large displaced populations. Nansen built a new internationalist refugee regime around a single core principle that recalled the Ottoman practice. And that was that refugees deployed as workers could serve as a convenient and cheap resource for their host states. Mm. So there are a number of manifestations of this. Um, one of Nansen's first efforts was to send displaced Armenians, quote unquote, back um, to the Soviet Union as a new labor force for that country's rebuilding efforts. When these plans proved insufficient, he also invented a new legal document, initially for Russian refugees, an identity card that came to be known as the Nansen Passport. You can see an example of this here slightly later. Um, these papers were valid for a year at a time, and they gave the bearer an ability, although not a guaranteed right, to move across international borders in search of work and to reside temporarily and on sufferance in these countries that acknowledged its validity. So in other words, what we have here is a kind of early guest worker program. By the mid 1920s, this approach expanded and the league began to run a kind of global employment matching system that fielded corporate requests for cheap labor and provided medical and security clearances, visa assistance, and sometimes some initial settlement funds, which we should note were nearly always subject to repayment with interest to any refugees who could be compelled to go. One league commission described the political rationale for this practice in these words, quote, the satisfactory solution of the problem of unemployment, which is one of the main causes of political unrest and which is seriously aggravated, if not at present dominated in some countries by the refugee problem, can alone be found in the emigration of the surplus populations from congested areas or emigrant states to immigrant countries which require labor for their normal economic development. So this is seen as a way to solve the problem of displacement on the one hand, maintain labor markets as they are in, in Western Europe and North America, and provide cheap labor in colonial and neo-colonial arenas. And in fact, the League settled many thousands of refugees in this way, but those numbers did not begin to make an impact on the broader problem of post-war displacement, largely because it faced continual resistance from refugees themselves, who generally were unenthused about traveling thousands of miles to become menial labor in French chemical factories or Brazilian sugar plantations. Um, and it also faced resistance from host states, who were increasingly skeptical, particularly as we get into the 1930s, of taking in large numbers of displaced people who might destabilize domestic labor markets. So by comparison, it was becoming evident that the League could really only enforce refugee employment in colonial spaces where it exercised active political and military authority. And that was largely the mandate territories of the Middle East. So during the 1920s and 1930s, it was Lebanon and Syria and Iraq and Palestine who all became test cases in an experiment to make mass refugee settlements serve the political and military and commercial interests of the European colonial powers through settlement and service and cheap labor, many times in dangerous occupations, including, of course, the oil industry. As one Iraq Petroleum Company official put it, quote, employees from settled areas found it difficult to adjust themselves to conditions in remote and hitherto uninhabited areas crossed by the pipelines and were therefore disinclined to accept long periods of service. But another source of workers who were adaptable to the new conditions of the industry was the as yet unsettled Assyrian refugee groups of the First World War. So by the time we get to the 1930s, this idea of putting refugees to work in colonial spaces is well established. We have had Ottoman iterations, we've had European iterations, we've had internationalist iterations. And during the Second World War, this refugees into workers approach got an American makeover. The high profile meeting of more than 30 countries at the French spa town of Evian in 1938 to discuss the problem of Jewish displacement had no outcome at all, other than showcasing the global stonewalling that was meeting displaced Jews. Mm. But one thing did become clear there, 
which was that Europe was handing off responsibility for internationalist refugee policy to the United States. Hmm. So following the failure of the conference back in the United States, Franklin Roosevelt appointed the geographer Isaiah Bowman to head up a clandestine intelligence mission that he called the M Project for Migration to come up with relevant ideas. And I think those of you who are European historians will recognize this idea in some respects because this kind of settlement planning had already come under criticism for its clear echoes of simultaneous Nazi schemes to do things like expel Jews to Madagascar. But Roosevelt and Bowman were undeterred. By 1945, the M Project had put together more than 600 studies of individual possible solutions, as they called it, to the problems of refugee resettlement, which all involved putting refugees to work in American concerns in all sorts of far-flung locations from California and Iraq to Angola and Kazakhstan. This project was a Actually abated after the war, Truman was not interested in it, but its ideas about turning refugees to American advantage abroad lived on at the new UN, where the idea of putting refugees to work became a fundamental cornerstone of post-1945 refugee policy and practice. Mm. In the immediate post-war years, it was expelled Palestinian Arabs who would become one of the main venues for this idea of turning the displaced into a convenient source of migrant labor. Though we should note that institutions like the International Refugee Office, which um, was one of the post-war iterations of what's now the UNHCR, also did this for European DPs, placing them in work in places like India, in Australia, in Canada, other places around the globe. But in Palestine, it took on a particular set of valences. In 1949, the UN approved a distinct legal category of what they called the Palestine refugee, which carried different and lesser legal protections than the purportedly more general category of refugee that would be formally defined a couple of years later in the 1951 Refugee Convention. And the reason I'm highlighting this is because this racialized distinction provided a crucial procedural model from the very beginning of this new human rights regime for how to keep non-white refugees displaced by decolonization at arm's length without publicly appearing to repudiate the principles of protection that were outlined in the convention. And it meant that this time when the old idea of turning refugees into essentially rightsless mobile menial laborers appeared again in this post-war context, it was a fate reserved mainly for non-white non-Europeans. Mm -hmm. So as the new UN worked to find not just employment as we've mentioned, but also citizenship for European DPs, we have something different happening for Palestine. A former director of the American Tennessee Valley Authority named Gordon Clapp got the UN's go ahead on a plan to use Palestinian refugees as workers on American backed schemes of irrigation, reforestation and industrial agriculture across the Middle East, particularly in Jordan and Gaza, as well as in the development of various oil concerns in Libya and the Gulf. Mm. Similar to the fate of such earlier refugees into workers programs, it did not take long before these grandiose clap style refugee worker schemes started to disintegrate under the political pressures of host state requirements, the breathtaking costs of installation, and especially the intensity of local opposition. So we can see some of the directions of Palestinian resistance here with activists taking the experience of refugeedom into directions that were never imagined by the UN. And in response, the international community largely abandoning the idea of Palestinian work in favor of the idea of Palestinian internment. So we can begin to see in images like this, the installation of camps as a permanent political feature of the landscape across the Middle East. So this is a point at which we start to see a different kind of relationship between refugees and the global labor market. And this time it's a turn towards refugee containment, still making use of refugees as workers where that seemed possible, but now without allowing them out of their settlements in the global South. And this was a practice that moved from Palestine into the UN's more general refugee toolkit via Algeria. 
1958, with some 20, sorry, 200,000 Algerian refugees already in Tunisia and Morocco and more arriving all the time, the UN made refugee assistance in North Africa a formal part of the UNHCR's directives. And over the next few years, that agency transformed the basic provision of food and supplies into a different kind of campaign, one of refugee documentation and incarceration, intended to restrict refugee movement and prevent the movement of supplies or men or information to the Algerian resistance. Mm. And crucially, the agency legitimized this approach exactly as the UN had legitimized its earlier approach to displaced Palestinians, and that was by identifying Algerian refugees as legally distinct from the earlier European variety. So as the High Commissioner Felix Schneider put it um, in 1962, there was a difference between new refugees and old refugees, the former representing a problem, as he put it, of material assistance and not of legal protection. Mm -hmm. So when the UN finally changed its defini de definition of refugees to include people from areas outside Europe, which it did in 1967, it did so in the knowledge that it had acquired first in Palestine and then in North Africa, that it was possible to use refugee aid mainly to immobilize what the UN was now calling, quote, non-convention refugees, with or without the supplemental provision of work, if that was possible, they would do that. Um, and it seemed that the idea of turning refugees, simply turning refugees into mobile laborers had largely run its course. Mm. Nevertheless, there are postscripts to this story, right? Over the subsequent decades, policymakers remained hopeful about the principle of deploying refugees as cheap global labor, and they explored some new iterations of this very old idea. In the first instance, in the 1980s, European states started to embrace the concept of what they called temporary protection, which was a new idea that had no prior basis in international law or in the conventions, but rather drew mainly on pre-1951 practices of remaking refugees as labor migrants. Mm. And especially in the early 1990s, as a new conflict returned the rest of refugee question to Europe, the EU tried to find ways to oust displaced people from the category of convention refugee, that is old refugee with the recognized rights that it implied, into various and rapidly proliferating categories of migrant that carried many fewer protections. So a bit like the Nansen passport of the 1920s, these kinds of novel documentary categories had the capacity to simply remake refugees as unprotected temporary laborers perpetually subject to expulsion, which was a situation widely viewed as beneficial to states and employers alike. And we can see the UNHCR's own approach to this here. Mm. Even more recently, to bring it nearly up to the present, in the context of the Syrian civil war, policymakers have also continued to think about ways of using refugee labor within the context of containment. Mm. In 2016, we saw an agreement called the Jordan Compact, which offered the Jordanian monarchy money from the EU and the UN to found what they called a special economic zone in Eastern Jordan, SEZ, that would employ refugees from the Syrian civil war. Mm -hmm. This system, like its predecessors, um, which was ostensibly set up to encourage refugee self-reliance, has met with great, a great deal of refugee resistance and required draconian systems of surveillance to force refugees to actually stay and participate. So in the Zaatari camp in Jordan, one of the SEZ's main proposed sources of these workers, residents are allowed to access food assistance only if they participate in a for-profit blockchain data mining system that among other things, tracks their movements. Mm. Okay. So I wanna just briefly return, finish by returning to the point from which we started, which is the international refugee regime self-portrayal as an attempted universalization of a post-1945 European attempt to guarantee basic rights for displaced people. Everything we have just looked at tells us a very, very different tale. And it's one about a global refugee regime that was built from its beginning around a pre-World War I imperial premise of exploiting refugees as laborers, particularly in colonized spaces. And in fact, we might well argue that apparently novel schemes like the Jordan Compact, designed to simultaneously detain and exploit the displaced, are not the exception, but the rule. 
just the most recent incarnation of a more than century old conversation about how to wring low wage work out of refugees without releasing them into protected labor markets in the global north. And above all, I think this reinterpretation explains why refugees themselves have been so resistant to internationalist policies that are purportedly being run for their benefit. It would seem, I would argue, that displaced people have understood the real purposes of the international refugee regime much more clearly than its other observers, who have by and large been pretty willing to accept the story that it tells about itself. So I want to close by saying that my hope here is that by actively working to historicize refugee studies, to think about the nature of these, these developments, we can not just strip away some of the regime's much repeated platitudes, but also learn to take refugee views and refugee objections much more seriously. In other words, I hope that we can finally take a hard look at what the international refugee regime was built for in the first instance, and the specifics of what it has wrought over its century plus of operation, most crucially for those who have actually found themselves living under its jurisdiction. So thank you very much for listening and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Robson, for this you know wonderful uh, overview of your book and uh, highlighting the key themes from your research and uh, importantly several uh, events of Middle East like Palestine and uh, uh, Syria are very uh, relevant at the moment uh, and and with the documents which you uh, which you you know shared on screen are really important resource for any students working in this area or even you know, interested in this current uh, reg regional conflicts and war. So uh, with this, we indeed would like to have more discussion on this and we would definitely carry it on. So and uh, so with this, let us now go to our commentary session. Uh, let us now go to our distinguished panelists uh, in our today's session for their commentary. And uh, I would uh, like to start with our first panelist in order, and that is Professor Fatma Muge Goshek. Uh, so, Professor Fatma Muge Goshek is the professor of sociology at the University of Michigan. As a, so as a sociologist by training, her research focuses on the comparative analysis of history, sociology, and politics in first and third worlds. Her scholarship broadly engages with the areas of nationalism, religious movements, and collective violence on minorities. Uh, some of her award-winning books include East Encounters West, France and the Ottoman Empire in the 18th century, The Transformation of Turkey, Redefining a State and Society from the Ottoman Empire to the Modern Era, and most recently, Denial of Violence, Ottoman Past, Turkish Present and Collective Violence Against the Armenians, 1789-2009. For her outstanding research contributions to Armenian genocide, she was awarded Mary Douglas Award, from the American Sociological Association. It is truly a privilege to have you with us, Professor, and the floor is yours. You're muted. There, yes. Well, thank you so much uh, for, for that, uh, uh, for the invitation and uh, uh, it gave me uh, the opportunity to read this amazing book. Uh, of course, uh, the most interesting part of the book for me as an Ottomanist and sort of Middle East scholar was uh, the location of the origins of something Western <laughs> in the Ottoman Empire. And, and this is uh, wonderful, especially uh, in terms of now, I guess, uh, uh, as we sort of... Uh, move away uh, from uh, the impact of Western European modernity on the rest of the world uh, and, and realize uh, uh, the sort of global uh, uh, negotiation of Western European modernity, uh, we are uh, becoming aware of <clears throat> origins of things beyond the West. Uh, but that is, of course, a trend that has been continued uh, uh, very much, you know, uh, by Black Atlantic, Black Athena, and and, and many of those similar, uh, uh, you know, uh, practices. What, uh, of course, uh, struck me the, the most uh, was the origin 
question of, of uh, the refugee policy uh, in uh, the Ottoman practices, especially uh, uh, 18, uh, uh, in the aftermath of, of 1856 uh, Crimea War and 1878 uh, war um, uh, with Russia. Uh, and those are indeed uh, the probably the most significant wars uh, of the Ottoman Empire uh, in the 19th century. What uh, interested me even more, though, uh, uh, was uh, what are the origins of the origins that Laura Robson uh, uh, actually identified? Because I think what happens in that context is uh, with uh, in, in mid uh, 19th century is you see uh, the Ottoman Empire having to negotiate the impact of Western European uh, modernity and sort of the expansion, of course, of Europe. Uh, colonization, you know, uh, towards the rest of the uh, the world uh, is, is that it happens at that uh, particular uh, juncture. Interestingly enough, when I started getting um, uh, involved uh, in um, um, in uh, Ottoman uh, history, uh, uh, I uh, wrote my master's thesis on the Ottoman deportation policy. Uh, you know, from the uh, 14th uh, to the 19th centuries. So that gave me an opportunity to sort of look at what the origins uh, initially were. As um, you probably uh, all know, of course, uh, uh, the Ottomans themselves uh, initially uh, uh, started uh, migrating uh, from Central Asia into Asia Minor. Uh, especially uh, in the sort of 11th, 12th centuries onwards, as a consequence of the changes in climate in Central Asia that sort of uh, uh, pushed them there. And it was, of course, uh, uh, the settled uh, populations in Arabian Peninsula that pushed the Ottomans, out, then the, the Turkoman tribes, let's say, to Asia Minor, uh, uh, to the outskirts of the Byzantine Empire. And that is sort of when um, the whole process starts. So I'm saying that to demonstrate that the Ottomans themselves were uh, actually nomadic in nature to start with. And the, this um, sort of, uh, from especially the migration from the Caucasus of these uh, Turkoman tribes uh, pretty much continued all the way uh, uh, in, until the sort of 15th, 16th century. And uh, I actually looked into my own ancestry and I did belong to one of those Turkoman tribes that came in about the 14th century and settled in East Anatolia. So um, there's an emphasis there even. Uh, what's more important uh, is that as... Uh, the Ottomans sort of uh, uh, started first as a principality in 1299 to then develop into an empire, people argue, with the conquest of Con Constantinople in 1453. Uh, what's very interesting is that uh, they themselves then um, seem to uh, start seeing um, uh, humans, uh, uh, you know, humans as resources uh, in uh, uh, you know, in, in, in sort of imperial settings. And uh, they started uh, when these Turkoman tribes uh, kept coming in, also moving them to the Balkans uh, to colonize the Balkans uh, pretty much while still under, uh, when it was still under Byzantine rule. I mean, so that is how it starts uh, going uh, uh, there. And um, what is very interesting is that it's done extremely well. The, you see the Ottoman imperial bureaucracy. Um, they uh, have population registers uh, of the people uh, at the location they were in, say in Asia Minor. Uh, they would keep uh, detailed uh, records. A copy of those records will be sent uh, to the center, the imperial center. And then uh, as they mo were moved uh, to the uh, other location under the uh, sort of guidance, literally, of sort of Ottoman um, uh, troops or gendarmerie, as the case may be. Then when they settled uh, in the new location, they would again have a, a register taken, and copies of these two registers would be sent uh, uh, to the uh, center, and uh, they would also be, uh, um, uh, you know, 
they wouldn't have to pay exempt from paying taxes for the last, I mean, for the next uh, decade or so, five to 10 years. And they were sometimes given grain or, or other, you know, residences and such, if, if there was such a thing. So that seems to be the, um, the origins. Of course, what is interesting about uh, uh, the juncture that uh, uh, Professor Robson talks about is the intersection of that practice with sort of the impact of Western expansion at the expense of the Ottoman Empire. I mean, that is why you have on the one side the Russians pushing down and on the other side, sort of the Balkan states also uh, becoming states out of uh, being Ottoman provinces initially. So for me, uh, you know, even though the origins are in uh, the Ottoman Empire, they emerge uh, as a consequence of the interaction, negotiation of Otto the Ottomans uh, with sort of Western uh, modernity. And in terms of uh, sort of the definition which uh, Professor Rapson gives, mainly uh, displaced, uh, uh, physically displaced and politically stripped uh, of identity and denationalized. I mean, it's the nationalism part of it, I think, that makes uh, not only uh, this um, sort of a new uh, status, but uh, at the same time, I think also in includes violence in it in a way that it hadn't been included. And I always blame uh, the French revolutions, uh, liberty, equality, and fraternity. I'm especially, uh, I think, uh, I. Uh, you know, uh, upset, not upset, I mean, you know, take issue with the fraternity aspect of it. I think that is when you have who belongs, who doesn't belong, defined within this new imagined community, which very quickly becomes very ethnic uh, in nature. And that is, I think, how these uh, negotiations are held. And and I, I sort of, I think I've done 10 minutes. Uh, I don't want to go is it okay? Yeah, go further. But what's interesting uh, for me is, uh, again, uh, uh, very much like, for example, the study of Haiti by uh, Trujillo or the st uh, st you know, study of the Balkans by Manuela Boatka and others, you suddenly see the intersections now of these uh, sort of emerging <clears throat> Western practices with local uh, sort of realities. And uh, they have sort of uh, eventually sort of a hybrid uh, practice emerging out of these the local and sort of more global uh, sources um, inter intersecting with one another. And um, I'll stop there. Thank you for this amazing book. <laughs> Regardless, uh, yes, it was wonderful to read and uh, very inspiring as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. And uh, it was uh, indeed uh, uh, an, an, an interesting book. And we will definitely discuss on this uh, more uh, during the uh, our discussion period. And we will also have a short Q&A if, uh, if uh, any questions are there from the participants. So uh, with this, we will now move on to our uh, second uh, panelist uh, in order. And uh, this is Professor Robert Hayden. Professor Robert uh, Hayden is the Professor Emeritus of Anthropology, Law, Public and International Affairs at the University of Pittsburgh. He's an anthropologist of law and politics and his ethnographic research engages with the issues of violence, nationalism, constitutionalism and state reconstruction in the Balkans and former Yugoslav space, as well as on uh, transitional justice issues stemming from Yugoslav wars. Professor Hayden has worked on uh, archival and archaeological data through fieldworks across continents, and his monogra important monographs include uh, From Yugoslavia to Western Balkans, Studies of a uh, European Disunion, 1991 to 2011, Blueprints for a House Divided, the Constitutional Logic of the Yugoslav Conflicts. It is a great honor to have you with us, Professor Hayden, and uh, over to you for your comment. Uh, Professor, you're muted. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think I think my computer did that because I apparently have an unstable connection, so I may go in and out. So it's a pleasure to be here. It's a it's a really good book, and it got me to think about many things that I hadn't thought about. And I'm particularly glad that the, that Laura Robson uh, took it back into the Ottoman Empire and looked for the the start of this. Now, having said that. I was uh, I was startled when she says it starts with uh, a place that was not anywhere in Europe, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, I'm sorry, in the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire was the sick man of Europe, not the sick man of Asia. And of course, I'm sitting in Serbia, which was part of the Ottoman Empire for about 500 years. And of course, it used to be part of the Near East. But um, but what we really do have going on here is a set of interactions that are that are are European and 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 stemming in as we said, from from the um, the Ottoman involvement with uh, with this part of the world, and that predates the French Revolution. Um, the the for the forced migrations of people uh, in the Balkans, uh, in in Bosnia, Hungary, Croatia, and the like, uh, start in the um, in the 16th century, and uh, you know particularly pick up in the 17th century. So it predates the French Revolution by by quite a bit. Now. This connects with me as I sit here in Serbia, um, because Serbia had the highest number of refugees uh, in Europe after World War II in the 1990s, about a million, uh, 550,000 refugees and another 200,000 IDPs, and that set the record until the Ukraine uh, conflict, and it may still be the record in a single country. Um, Serbia also has a, a role and actually had a key role in, in starting the, the flow of migrants in 2015 uh, to, into Western Europe, which I can talk about if we have time. But there's also been a very sizable, since the start of the Russian war, there are probably a quarter of a million Russians, at least another 50,000 Ukrainians in Serbia right now, who have fled the war. Now, interesting, I think refugees or not would be another question, but it does make the topic uh, quite uh, quite alive to me. And also because there are, are Gastarbeiteri in Serbia living under fairly inhuman conditions. So it all connects. Um, now, um, you know, also going into the, the the dark side of the nonsense passports and the like, and, and FDR's, uh, Project M, I mean, as lunacy, I had absolutely no idea. And as an anthropologist, the fact that Henry Field was anthropologist to the president, I don't think the American Anthropological Association is going to want to know that, or they'll do some heavy apology, apologizing. Anyway, um, if I can say the most concise statement of the argument is, is on page four, um, for more than 100 years, the idea of turning refugees into uh, menial workers, um, uh, preferably in, in colonial and semi-colonial settings far from the global north, has served as a driving force behind the construction and operation of the international refugee regime. Now, I say it's well argued and well supported, um, but although I like the book, uh, there are aspects of it, I think, that are not necessarily clear to me or that I think uh, could be um, developed, um, developed more. Um, if we take it back to the uh, Ottoman decisions in the mid-19th century, they were confronted with, with tens to hundreds of thousands of people expelled uh, from, from the Balkans and the Caucasus. And it really uh, starts majorly from Greece in, in the 1820s and 1830s, Serbia in the 1830s uh, through the 1860s, uh, before you get to the, 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 the cataclysms of, of 1878 and the Crimean War is in there as well. Now, the Ottomans uh, uh, are said in the book to have made the crucial decision to put the refugees to work in the service of the state um, to consolidate uh, the state and, and economic development in distant or difficult areas. Okay, but it was also said that Professor Robson also says that they were they had recognized the problem of these folks being um, denationalized, and they wanted to incorporate them as Ottoman citizens, and uh, and that type of of, uh, of incorporation uh, is. Um, is critical, and I think is 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 critical in different types of um, of of refugees and of of migrations. And I think it's the critical difference between uh, 
what we're seeing in, in 2015 with Europe and what the Ottomans were facing in the 1850s, the Ottomans wanted to incorporate these people. The West Europeans want to do anything but that. And, uh, and that's not necessarily a new phenomenon. Uh, it was striking to me, so much of this book uh, is focused on the Palestinians. I started out as a South Asianist and South Asianists know about partition and in 1947, in a very short period of time, uh, probably 15 times as many people um, moved between India and Pakistan as there were Palestinians. And the death toll was probably twice as many as there are Palestinians total. Um, and yet those folks were incorporated into India or Pakistan within a very short period of time. And I mean, thoroughly incorporated. There were some exceptions, the Bengalis in, 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 uh, in Pakistan and the like. But that's really quite striking as opposed to the Palestinians and how much of the Palestinians uh, condition and treatment has, has been related to the fact that uh, unlike the, uh, the people going to, um, uh, to Anatolia uh, or the people going between India and Pakistan or between Greece and Turkey in 1923, um, they were not going to places where they were going to be recognized, where they were going to be incorporated as citizens, and where they would be employed. And I think that's, um, that's important. Uh, how do you incorporate uh, populations um, without, without employing them? And so when it is stated that this is part of what the League meant to do, was to, uh, to provide uh, people with employment. Well, insofar as the efforts were to incorporate them into the societies into which they were going, they would have to be employed. What would be the alternative? Keeping them in the camps uh, doesn't, doesn't do very well. And some of the early uh, refugee studies by anthropologists in the 1980s and, and 1990s, working primarily in Africa, we're demonstrating how much the people who were confined in camps like uh, Burundi uh, were, were hopeless, whereas the people, because the language was basically the same, who could somehow fake a local identity and go out and get employed, um, they did very well. They had, they had no problems. So if you're going to incorporate people into, um, into the, the places where they're, uh, where they're being moved, um, that, uh, that would seem to require finding them jobs and helping them find jobs. And, and I think that's a very different type of, uh, of, of, refu of refugee um, situation. I said Serbia had uh, a half million refugees in the 1990s. They were, many of them, incorporated into Serbia um, and uh, many more, of course, left on their own to go to other places. But the, the, the whole point of the exercise was to incorporate people as it was in, in Bosnia and Croatia. There were people going the, uh, the other ways uh, again. And so, you know, when I, when I, when I read it, um, I think these are very different types of settings. And, and I noticed that there was one reference uh, that in 1947, um, the new United Nations managed to avoid any consideration of the brutal forced migration uh, between India and, uh, and Pakistan of Indian partition. Well, with all due respect, there wasn't anything the UN knew as it was could have done. That partition, the violence of the partition was to some extent anticipated. The, the depth of it uh, was not anticipated. And um, there was no force that was able to contain it. Uh, the British offered to stay and Nehru and Jinnah both said, are you nuts? You know, the whole point of the independence movement was to demonstrate that, that Indians and Pakistanis could govern themselves. So the idea that a European power would have to come in and save them, um, that was not on. And that, if it had happened, it would have been a devastating blow to the types of um, of uh, independence movements that uh, took a lot of inspiration from India and Pakistan, uh, and uh, and that led to the non-aligned movement and and um, and the like. So I think that's a very different um, type of thing. Many uh, many types, uh, many in many cases, refugees 
uh, could be incorporated into states in which they were going. Not necessarily easily. And uh, that collection that Bruce Clark uh, of The Economist wrote called uh, Twice a Stranger is, is really quite fascinating. You know how the the, the incomers, the Karamanlis from uh, from Turkey into Greece, you know, carried that identity for generations, and it had had political and other repercussions. Um, but uh, in, in those types of, of cases, it works fairly well, and that's very different from um, from from Palestine. Um, and let me uh, let me end actually with 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 Serbia. Um, the, the start of the 2015 migrations into Western Europe uh, started actually with a success of the European Union, a diplomatic success. In 2015, the European Union managed to force Serbia into accepting Kosovo Albanian identity documents and letting Kosovo Albanians who had them uh, come into, uh, into Serbia which they did. They had no intention of staying in Serbia, but they knew that the border with Hungary was flat, rural, undefended completely. There wasn't even a fence. And so they knew that if they could get to the border, they would not have problems. And the Serbs, no fools, immediately put buses at their disposal to go up to the border. And, uh, and I remember we all marveled in, in a cold winter marching, watching these Albanian families go, uh, go marching into to Hungary through the snow, you know, holding their kids by the hand and the like. That was filmed in Serbia. It made international coverage. And the next thing we knew was the following summer, uh, tens of thousands of well-off, many of them, Syrians and Iraqis who had realized that, you know what, you can get by land to Serbia. And if you get by land to Serbia, you can get into Hungary and get into the European Union. And, uh, and those folks had, um, uh, many of them had, uh, had resources. They had, they had languages, they had university degrees, they had credit cards, they had money. Um, and, uh, and they went through, the Serbs again said, they would give them a document that would give them a week to register as refugees in Serbia. And none of them did. They didn't want to stay in Serbia. They used the week to get to Hungary and then went through. But they have since been followed by many other people without all of those resources. And of course, the treatment of these folks through time and as their economic status has declined has been very different. Um, they still don't want to stay in Serbia. And so they're not uh, particularly uh, even even thought of that much here. They don't want to stay in Bosnia either, but they kind of wash up on the border with Croatia and there's increasing resentment to them, even among Bosnian Muslims who originally accepted them because of their own experiences in the 1990s. So uh, as I said, I, as I said I, the, the book made me think about all sorts of things and it, it led me down paths that I didn't even know that there were paths like that. And I think it's a major... Uh, accomplishment, and I'm going to cite it, and I'm going to recommend it to people. But I, it did strike me that um, um, there are uh, very different types of situations, depending on whether the, the people being displaced are going into, as, as Hannah Arendt once phrased it, uh, going returning to homelands where they've never been. And thus, the aim is to incorporate them. Uh, and the folks who are going places where the places they're going uh, are not overly thrilled uh, to see them and are, uh, don't want to incorporate them. And I think that's a very different matter. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll stop here. Thank you, Professor Hayden. And uh, now I would like uh, Professor Robson to uh, respond and then we will uh, have the conversation. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you both so much for these wonderful comments. And I think there's there's so much to pick up on here. Um, and I'll I'll do my best to kind of bring them together a little bit, but I want to say how much I appreciate your your readings and your your thoughtfulness in responding. Um and I I think that there is a connection between the things that the two of you are saying about this question of employment and integration and what, what migration means within a state, right? 
Um, and I want to maybe first acknowledge that I completely agree with Professor Hayden's um, commentary about the inclusion of the Ottoman Empire in Europe. I, it's you're, you're absolutely right. And it is part of Europe. And it's also part of other parts of the world. I mean, I think this is one of one of the things that we need to acknowledge, right, that that both can be true. Um, and that Europe had a just as a side note, I think it, it is also true that Europe had a reluctant relationship with the Ottoman Empire, particularly by the time we get to this stage, um, the idea of kind of acknowledging it as a sick part of Europe, um, but maybe not a kind of whole, whole citizen, right, is, is perhaps um, one aspect of this relationship. But it is absolutely true. The Ottoman Empire is in Europe. Its territories are in Europe. It is it is a European power in many kind of crucial ways. So I, I absolutely agree and acknowledge that. Um, I think this question of, so I want to go back to, first of all, to something that Professor Gocek said um, about the kind of migratory origins of the Ottoman state. And this is fascinating. And I think you could write something very interesting about some of the earlier incarnations of these concepts. But I'm struck in your, your commentary. I think one of the things that's particularly interesting about that, that actually does carry through to the 20th century, is the idea that migrants can be builders of the state who become central you know, um, figures of, of government, right? Um, and that in fact, being a migrant in the Ottoman context, and you know much more about this earlier period than I do, but I, I would argue that certainly even in the late 19th, early 20th century, the origin points of um, some of the young Turks, for instance, is in the Balkans, right? Um, people are from places like Salonika. Um, and that the idea of being a migrant, being from these peripheral regions, having moved into Anatolia, this is not disqualifying, right? This is not, this is in fact part of a long tradition of incorporation. And so I do think that when the Ottomans put together, it's true that I have located these kinds of policies of making use of refugees as labor in the Ottoman state. But I do think that from the Ottoman perspective, that this was part of a longer tradition of incorporating migrants into practices of governance, of imperial governance, as well as making use of them as kind of workers, right? And that perhaps we could connect, it would be very interesting to see how we could connect back that political tradition um, you know, that that has this much older, these much older iterations into this moment where it is intersecting in fairly toxic ways, I think, with concepts of, of nation statehood and of ethnicity and of, um, you know, Turkishness, emerging kind of concepts of Turkishness. And so that we do have um, manifestations of this later that are that are that are exploitative to refugees and also destructive to local communities in some places. Um, you know, I think the kind of active forcible settlement of nomadic tribes, for instance, in some of the eastern regions of Anatolia is a good example of that. But, but that there is an underlying assumption that migrants can become part of the state in a meaningful way, and not just as workers. That eventually they they will be they will be citizens. They will be nationalized. They will you know come to serve as part of the the apparatus of empire. So this brings me to this other question that Professor Hayden raised, which is you know how people could be integrated without employment. What the concept of integration means. How this intersects. I think one of the things you're suggesting is how this intersects with the concept of exploitation. And I think here, one of the things that happens as this concept migrates from the Ottoman sphere into the internationalist sphere, the Western European sphere being run from Geneva, is that this employment is not open employment, right? It is specifically um, demarcated as being menial labor for empires, for imperial concerns. And so this actually isn't a question of integration. It's a question of use and of removal in a way that is, you know, has very little to do with refugee interests themselves. And the question for the League of whether, for instance, Assyrians who, you know, that there was this plan in the late 1930s to send Assyrians from Iraq to Brazil to work in plantations there. And the question of whether Assyrians would assimilate in Brazil is not meaningful to the league, right? This is not, this is not their goal. They their their goal is to get rid of a problem in Iraq, to provide labor, local labor in Brazil for this, these foreign-owned concerns. And the question of integration, I think. To the extent that it comes up at all, it is a question of 
ensuring that integration elsewhere will not happen, right? That these people will not go to Europe, they will not stay in Iraq. Um, and so I think that these, these concerns actually are quite different. And it's parallel to the Palestinian case in that when we think about the idea of Palestinian absorption or integration into the surrounding Arab countries, which is of course what Israel wanted in the early years after 1948, the way that the UN imagined doing that was not through integration in any kind of local employment. It was through very restricted kinds of employment, mainly in American concerns, mainly in kind of spheres of active commercial modernization, right, and industrialization that were being bankrolled by the United States. And so I think that one of the things we need to keep in mind when we think about this kind of externally directed refugee employment is that it is heavily restricted, both in terms of the kind of work that refugees will be permitted to undertake and where they will be permitted to do it. And so I think that the question here really isn't one of integration, but rather one of exclusion and restriction. Um, and that that is something that we do see really kind of fairly consistently across a number of different refugee cases um, through the 20th century. Um, I want just very briefly, I will, I'll keep my comments relatively short so that we can we can have a conversation, but I want just relatively briefly to pick up on the um, partition question as well, which I do think is a really meaningful comparison and an interesting comparison, not least because, of course, the reason that the UN became such a major operator in Palestine was that it was regarded by multiple sides of the emerging conflict there as having been an architect of that conflict, right? First by it, you know, by the League of Nations support for the settlement of Palestine by European Jews, by the inclusion of that requirement in the mandate, by the kind of, um, by the UN's active settlement of displaced European Holocaust survivors in Israel, um, which is not what many of them wanted, right? Not where many of them wanted to go. Um, and so there was the sense that the UN was responsible for the disaster in Palestine in a way that it was not responsible for the disaster in um, South Asia. That said, there are some interesting conversations that are happening at the international level in the context of the um, construction of this refugee operation about India, Pakistan, and whether these refugees were in fact to be counted as part of this kind of post-war mass global displacement. And that is something that is discussed. And the UN's perspective in the end, the decision was that this was quote unquote, a domestic issue. Um, and that the states, the emerging states would have to deal with it as a domestic issue. I think it's relevant that those states picked up on the term refugee and made use of some of the same structures of the refugee regime nationally that the UN was putting into place um, internationally. Um, but but that 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 frame was conceived very differently, right? Where we we can see that kind of national frame meaning something maybe closer to what happens in the Ottoman sphere, where mi these migrants will at least potentially not everyone, not always, right? There are many many terrible terrible stories that come even in the years after partition, um, but that there is the possibility of inclusion in the structures of governance um, that will not be the case for, for instance, Palestinians. Um, but finally, I do want to note as well that the UN found this category of national refugee to be fungible and convenient, and that in Algeria, where initially the UN did not have a mandate to operate among refugees there, and declared that this was also a domestic situation because Algeria was technically a part of France, and so this was a kind of civil war, and that these were domestic refugees for whom the UN bore no responsibility until the emerging UNHCR and the UN writ large began, and the United States began to see some utility in the practice of refugee resettlement and control in North Africa. And then all of a sudden this transformed from being a domestic issue to an international issue and opened a door for the UN's involvement in all sorts of conflicts going forward. Um, you know, After the Algerian war, we can see that people have a much more expansive idea of what constitutes a legitimate refugee um, intervention across the globe. Um, so these are kind of highly, um, they, they are fungible and convenient categories in some respects. And I think that, that the comparison of South Asia is a particularly instructive one in that respect. So there's lots more I could say, but I think I'll close there. And thank you so very much for these really wonderful comments and um, I, we can continue the conversation.
Definitely, Professor. And uh, so thank you so much for the response and the commentaries that we covered. So yeah, and definitely we will be, ha we have time for uh, a lot, I mean, follow-ups as well as the questions to discuss with this. And uh, so, uh, and before that, uh, so I, I would like to go to Professor J. Winter, who is co-steering the discussion with me in today's discussion hour. So I would uh, ask Professor Winter to, you know, uh, just give some valuable uh, comments and uh, the note as well as if, if he has some questions to ask for you. Professor Winter, over to you. Thank you, Sumava. And thank you, Laura, for, uh, for the book, first of all, and secondly, for taking the time to uh, provide this forum, which I hope uh, quite a few people will uh, will find uh, when it becomes an entry on YouTube. Shouldn't take a few more, uh, just a few more days. Sumava is very efficient. Um, I do have there are real questions. <laughs> the first is, I'd like to draw you out on the link between your theoretical position and empirical research and your work on statelessness. It's a word you didn't use uh, today. Now, it, it seems to me and I may, I, I, stand, I will stand corrected. That's why it is a real question. Uh, that statelessness is a constituent part of your story. Uh, and that the Palestinian tragedy is the tragedy of statelessness understood in, in ways that I think uh, Hannah Arendt <clears throat> understood. And, um, you know, uh, Colleen is with us now. We're, we're two inches away from completing our book on statelessness. But it, it strikes me that uh, that the, the the dilemma of statelessness uh, is uh, at the core of what Nansen uh, was not only doing, uh, but what he was was charged to do. That was that was what it really was all about. And so I, I really do want to hear you uh, relate what your book tells us about statelessness. The second issue is to ask whether you might weaken or make more porous or modify the term regime. Uh, I'm still impressed with Davide Rodonio's critique. And here I would suggest uh, going along with Peter Gattrell uh, that it's 1951 and 1967 that creates a regime and not necessarily a beneficent one for refugees, one that can produce uh, uh, what might be described as a, a bureaucratic uh, um, iron cage where refugees have to justify their own personal experience uh, of uh, persecution. It can't be a national story. It has to be their very own one. And, and as Gettrell has shown, this is, this is punishing and can work in entirely deleterious ways. So I'm not sure about the use of the word regime. And the third point is, is an historian's point. Isn't it possible that your story actually is bifurcated? And the reason why the first one doesn't work in 1921 is because the European economies were in depression uh, after the failure of the post-war boom that never happened, whereas the post-Second World War period is the biggest, I think, recharging of the capital accumulation uh, of the European hegemonic powers and the United States. Um, to replace the capital that wasn't, that was running down in the depression of the 1930s and creating an imperial world to exploit labor in a way that they couldn't get away with in the interwar years because they were economically too weak to do so. So uh, I see the story very much as failure in the interwar years to do what you're saying, human capital, and a successful story in the post-1948 period. I see there are two um, in some ways, I, I agree entirely in, in reading your book. I did, I did see the, you know, the sweep, the imaginative sweep of your project, and I admire it. I really do. But I wonder if there's, there actually are two stories here that are related in the, you know, in the Kondratiev cycle, in the, the fact that there are entirely different periods of capital accumulation uh, and of the drive of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of profit in, in, in world capital. It's, it's no accident you see that that uh, Thomas Piketty's uh, inequality curve stops in post-1945 for 30 years before it gets going again and winds up where we are today. There, there is something unusual about the post-1945 period that I think separates it from the, the, the 1920s. And uh, the final point, uh, I, would, I think Nansen meant putting people to work on the land, 
That's what he had in mind for the Greek Orthodox uh, population in Greece. Uh, that, that is to say, the Turkish population that was expelled and you know and, and and you know murdered and pillaged and raped and everything else. They were supposed to be farmers, and one reason why he thought that farmers are terrific is because they won't be communists. They, he actually underestimated the intelligence of the people who wound up in Greece, uh, many of whom became pillars of the communist movement. But uh, the, the fear of communism is something that I didn't hear you uh, talk about in the 1920s period. Um, uh, of course, it has a different configuration 19, in the 1940s. But isn't it possible that, that, there, that Nansen had an answer for you, uh, which is he, he wanted farmers. He wanted farmers to be the, um, the workers. Uh, uh, of the 2 million, uh, 1.5 million or, or so uh, Greek Orthodox people who either fled or were expelled and were, were treated as non-persons, lost their, they were stateless until they got into Greece and took on, took the new citizenship. But this, this conflict between the, you know, the contrast between the 1920s and the 1940s is one I'd, I'd really like to draw you out on, Laura. So thank you so much for the book. And I hope these questions are, are of interest and helpful to you in the future. Yes, these are great questions. I thank you so much. This really, really fascinating ideas in here. Um, I'm going to backwards with the Nansen working on the land question and the difference between the 1920s and the 1950s, because this is something that has struck me as well, that in fact, it's not just Nansen, but the, many of these resettlement plans have to do with the idea of making rural, actually taking urban refugees who are widely regarded yeah, as dangerous right. girls reasons, right? Not not least of which is their potential boom. Um, and making them into rural agricultural workers. And that is a feature, particularly in Macedonia. Um, and I think this is an instructive case because it's so central to the early Nansen's kind of early planning, right? And the league's early planning for refugees. But also because part of that idea is not just about remaking refugees as, you know, people, as farmers who will not be troublesome, but also about territorializing Macedonia for the Greek state, mm. right? That's and right. The, that, that agricultural work, it's actually very similar in some respects to some of the things that are being said about Zionism in Palestine, right? That working the land is a way of claiming the land for the state politically, right? Not just not just in terms of um, you know, not just in terms of industrialization, although that's part of it, and not just in terms of making refugees into you know productive workers, although that's also part of it, but of actually making it clear that this is a this is this is going to be part of the state, and we are territorializing it. We're putting in roads, we're putting in schools, we're putting in clinics, we're putting in farms. It will be evidently part of the state project. And further, this has internationalist ramifications too, because part of the idea of the post-war settlements in the 1920s for the Allies was precisely this plan of putting into place a kind of, you know, ring of, um, you know, a, a, a protective ring of states between Europe and the Soviet Union. And so my point here is that these issues that seem at first to be about making refugees into specific kinds of worker populations have ramifications all the way up, right? They are local and they're regional and they're national, and then they're also international, right? And also imperial. And so I think part of what I want to say here is that I, I really think that the, the, the part of this that is a, human, a humanitarian enterprise is vanishingly tiny and might not exist at all, right? Um, but the, and that rather there are kind of so many layers of interest and that the interests of refugees themselves are virtually absent from the picture, um, but that we can identify how and why these policies get put into place when they do. Um, so I think that that rural thing is actually very important, right? Be, and not not just for what's happening on the ground locally, but also kind of for the Good ways point. that um, and in terms, of, so I thought a lot about this this question of, of periodization when I was writing the book, be, because it does seem to be there are there are some major differences between the regime and I'll, uh, I'll I, I appreciate your kind of concern about that word and I'll pick it up in a second um, of the 1920s and the one that comes into place after 1945. One of which is that 
in the 1920s, the category of refugee is much more restricted, right? It is legally restricted essentially to Russians and Armenians, and then a few of these other Assyrians come in later in some some ways. But there are there the league is very specific that refugees are not just displaced people, right? But they are rather they are displaced people that the league has identified for a particular reason that as as kind of you know being a ward of of this international body. And um, in a lot of ways, I think this, I didn't really talk about this in the book, but I think it actually picks up on Ottoman politics as well in the way that the same the same populations who can be designated as refugees after 1920 are the ones who were client populations of European states in the late Ottoman period, the Armenians in particular. Um, and so it has resonances with all sorts of earlier questions about who constitutes a minority, for instance, right? Um, which is also a restricted category in lots of ways. So that's kind of a side note. Um, but I think that actually, I would say that in terms of the success or failure, I'm a little bit nervous about using those terms, but that it's almost the other way around, that the League does in fact manage to place people in work in the 1930s in a way that it really can't in the 1950s. And that is partly about, so there, there are two things, I think. One is about the ways in which imperial states can control the economies of their colonial spaces, which becomes harder after 1945, not impossible, but harder. Um, and the and and in part it has to do with, so if we think about the 1950s as a moment of the expansion of the refugee regime on the one hand, but it is also the beginning of these regimes of containment in very, very clear ways, right? And so we have this kind of increased industrialization does, you know, we do have this post-1945 boom, but we very shortly thereafter have things like the invention of the shipping container and the invention of these kind of concentrated spaces of production where you don't need enormous numbers of people. And so the kind of need for that sort of labor drops precipitously fairly quickly, certainly by the time we get to the 1960s and the 1967 protocol. And so there is a very early anxiety, even as the regime is expanding, there is also this kind of tremendous anxiety about releasing particularly decolonial refugees into a global labor market, right? Um, so I think this has to do again with the question of states that in the 1930s, empires still matter, right? They still matter territorially. They, they, are, they are still in control of their spaces in some respects. By the time we get to the 1950s, the empires are still there and they are still controlling world economies, but they're doing so through the use of national borders and the restriction of the movement of populations, even as they unrestrict the movement of goods in some respects, right? And so I think that they actually work, they really work at cross purposes. And that's partly why we have this kind of expansion of a global labor force in some respects at the same time that there are increased restrictions on refugees. And that ultimately, I would say, the answer to that problem at the international level comes to be that we will make refugees and migrants into the same kind of category where we can deploy them as workers at will, but remove them when we don't need them anymore. And that's why we start to get this proliferation of categories like temporary right to remain and humanitarian protection. And you know, this is what we have now, right? The category of refugee, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of categories. And most of them come only with temporary protections, right? Most of them have time limited visas, you know, time limited protections. And so, so this has been the solution. I think this has been what has happened um, as, a, as a way to make these people potentially useful, but also disposable and to ensure that they do not become a kind of political political problem for host states in terms of their own levels of capacity to demand, you know, to 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 demand worker rights essentially. Um, so I think that I think it's a slightly more complicated. I take your point about the periodization, but I think there are other elements at work here as well um, that sort of flip some of those questions on their head, if that makes sense. Um, and then just final, I'll, I'll try to touch on the statelessness question very quickly. Yes, this is clearly, actually it relates to the periodization as well, right? Because I think some of these early, you know, these early attempts to think about what could happen to displaced people, it's, it's interesting, right? Because one of the things they assume is that like statelessness might be fine in some circumstances, right? I mean, one of the things that, 
the Nansen passport assumes is that the, the, the bestowal of citizenship is probably impossible, but not, but might not be the only path forward, right? And he's working on that assumption in the context of a just post-imperial world where people have living memories of how empires worked when, you know, people don't have passports in general, borders are porous, people move around, these spaces are multinational and multi-ethnic. And I think it's remarkable that that, that political memory really lasts for quite a long time, even as even as it is its manifestations are kind of crashing down into brutality and all, all sorts of spheres of spheres. Um, and that by the time, you know, I, so the question of statelessness, the real question of statelessness is how important is it, right? Does it matter? Do you need a nationality? And one of the striking things that sets the refugee regime on the path to where we are now is the decision in 1948 to decide that nationality is a human right, right? And that decision, I think I would say was a tragic error, um, but also makes it impossible to imagine a world in which a stateless person or a stateless community can operate in a in a normal way. And so I think that, you know, the question of Palestine is, of course, particularly instructive here, but it's actually not the only one, um, you know, where I think there, there this question of kind of how important the possession of nationality is, is decided at the highest levels, and not by the people who are lacking statehood, right, and not by the people who are lacking citizenship. So I, I think that this is actually something that's ripe for um, reconsideration as a kind of scholarly and political question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so we have uh, a room for maybe a very few reflections. So I just wanted to ask a question to Professor Robson. And uh, uh, Professor Robson, in your book, you, uh, uh, you didn't highlight much on the Indian refugees or the partition, which is actually fine because in global history, we cannot uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, accommodate everything, every aspect, then it would be an encyclopedia, actually. So, but your works uh, have significantly dealt with Palestinian refugees. You have a chap entire chapters dedicated to Palestinian displacement and global Zionism. So nowadays, you know, because of the current war in Gaza, there are, you know, we find a vast number of comparisons which also came up today, like uh, drawn between refugees of India, Pakistan, Israel, Palestine, and even the Holocaust. So how do you see these comparisons? And I would be very happy if uh, Professor Hayden could also chip in this because he has work, uh, worked on India very uh, importantly and extensively. So like uh, as both, you have, both of you have worked on archi in archives and on uh, also uh, refugee memories, so how do you see these comparisons? And also importantly, do you, I mean, uh, agree with the issue of colonial violence? How do you compare the, you know, the manifestation of colonial violence in these uh, uh, partitions between Israel, Palestine, India, Pakistan, or even the refugees of, you know, Holocaust? Yes, so, yeah. Robert, would you like to chime in on that? <laughs> Oh, I think you're muted still. Mm. You did. Yeah. Mm. You're muted, yeah. Uh, am I on? Yeah. Oh, no, I'm go. not now. Again, the, the computer uh, muted me. Yeah, I mean, certainly the um, colonial, the phenomenon of, of colonial power withdrawal, uh, these are not the only only cases of it, of it leading to, to de facto partitions. Cyprus is another one. Uh, so is Kashmir, for that matter. Kashmir doesn't get partitioned in 1947 uh, because it's not it's not part of the line that was drawn. It was still a, a princely state, and it doesn't get uh, partitioned until 1948. Um, so you know you have you have situations in which colonial powers were interested primarily in the natives not fighting each other because if they don't fight each other, if they're fighting each other, they're not generating revenue. And since the point of the, of the whole colonial enterprise is to generate revenue to be shipped to the metropolitan center, um, you know, they were very happy to, um, 
to to keep uh, the natives more or less under control. And I've I've tracked this in central India and a number of type of Hindu Muslim uh, conflicts over shrines and the like. And they're always happy to do this. Uh, but then the question does become, um, you know, whose country is this going to be? And uh, again, this is not, this is actually a problem in in Bosnia. I mean, Bosnia has been very peaceful. Uh, until the withdrawal of the Ottomans in, in 1877, 1878. And then you get warfare and then the Austro-Hungarians take over until 1919 and you get a lot of conflict again. And then the kingdom of Yugoslavia until it collapses in 1941 to 1945. And that's the worst horror show. And then the demise of the communist uh, uh, regime uh, leads to another one. Uh, so is it necessarily colonial? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's an external power maintaining things under control. Uh, and of course, it's also in part um, uh, democratic politics, Michael Mann's uh, The Dark Side of Democracy and the tendency towards uh, majoritarianism, uh, which, which India avoided until now, until the BJP and Modi. Uh, and I, kind of, I miss Nehru's secular republic um, for all of its flaws, uh, but it's definitely dead. Uh, but in a way, I mean, they, uh, Modi is now demonstrating that Jinnah was right in 1946, 1947, that independent India would become Hindustan and would be oriented to, against Muslims. So that's kind of a long, drawn, multi-comparison, but I think that's where it goes. How much of that is colonialism? How much of that is simply external imposition of types of controls, which we can call communist colonialism if we want, but I don't see a reason, uh, is another issue. It's interesting too, to, I mean, uh, Okay, so, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just wanted Go ahead. to sort of make yeah. a comment uh, which, which, which may be uh, pertinent uh, in this context, because uh, Gurminder Bambra has uh, recently working on uh, sort of separating empires along Western and non-Western axes. And uh, she argues that uh, there are empires of extraction that goes for Western empires versus uh, empires of incorporation. Uh, that sort of emphasizes the non-Western ones and especially uh, the Ottoman Empire in that uh, context. Uh, so maybe that is also something that the dynamics also, of course, the political dynamics uh, are there. And I wanted to add also to the stateless people, uh, the Kurds, I, which I'm working on at the moment. Uh, uh, that also, of course, is, is pertinent. And one more thing uh, is that um, in the Ottoman Empire, the way they see the subjects is very different uh, than citizens are seen in the sense that the, uh, the Sultan is supposed to be given sort of, you know, uh, rights, I guess, or whatever, power by God, uh, you know, to see to his flock. Uh, the word used uh, for subjects, the re'aya, re'aya means a flock, like a flock of sheep. And I think that is how they perceive all humans, all subjects, as sort of, you know, members of that flock one way or the other, which is a very different way of seeing the, the, them as resident aliens or sort of foreign bodies. Uh, I think that sort of captures the difference between incorporation and extraction as well. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a very important distinction and it has to do with migration as well in a more kind of general way. Um, but also I, I think that it it this also connects with this other question about nationality as kind of an ordering principle of the global after 1945, because I think that when we look at what happens in, in partition in India, and the question of the relationship with Palestine is interesting because obviously there are relationships and people can say, you know, partition of in 1947 and 1948, but actually it doesn't happen in Palestine, right? We don't, we don't really have, we don't have partition in the same way. Um, so the outcome is, is radically different. Um, but the thing that decolonizing countries are facing in this moment is a world in which the nation state has been declared publicly and without reservation as the only viable form of political organization going forward, right? 
And so that entails the active abandonment and the active rejection of all of these other political traditions that, you know, I mean, it's hard to say, I don't want to be too romantic about this, but, you know, have have seeds of pluralism in them, right? Um, at least, and have to be have to be jettisoned quite suddenly. I mean, I think that histories of partition in South Asia suggest that this is really, you know, a very late breaking operation, right? In in some respects, um, so I think part of it has to do with an international context as well, in which these decolonizing countries are trying to kind of stake their claims on a global stage, and they see that there are very specific pathways to doing that. I would just say one thing, if I may, and it, it has to do specifically with the Ottoman Empire, but some others, incorporation with presumed dominance. It's always clear in the Ottoman Empire who's dominant and who's subordinated. And I've been spending the last 15 years looking at how this plays out in the field. You know, there are no churches built in Bosnia between, uh, between the 16th and the 19th century. They just weren't permitted. Or there were there were just wooden ones, and there were legends that you know they moved themselves when they heard the Turks coming, right? Um, so there's always domination, and this is in part what gives um, what gives such momentum to the independence movements is that by God we're not going to be dominated anymore, and uh, they particularly take force when from the 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 internal. European empires suddenly gain military superiority technologically to the Ottomans and defeat them and start pushing them out of Hungary, Magyaristan, uh, Croatia, Hrvatistan, and uh, and setting them up on the border in in Bosnia uh, and and marking that border with mosques. When I was just on that border a week ago, taking pictures of them to demonstrate whose territory it is. So let's not romanticize here because. Um, you know, there was no sense of incorporation in, with equality, uh, incorporation with with presumptions of domination. Yeah, that's there. If you're willing to accept it, fine, you'll do fine. Don't try to build a church. Well, actually, uh, if I may add to that, uh, uh, when you say domination, it's domination based on religion. I mean, you know, a particular kind of Sunni Islam, of course, of the Hanifi legal tradition. But nevertheless, uh, what's very important is that if you think about it, nation state and nationalism is an imagined community, as Ben Anderson says. And it's no accident that the community around which people organized before that uh, was a religious one. I mean, so in a way, you see this, this, this shift. Uh, and I think, uh, as uh, Professor Rapsom talks about it, this sort of then containment. Uh, and, and violence uh, in the na national context uh, that is preceded. And also the domination continues, for example, in the sense that in the North African uh, pro provinces or in the Balkans, even though, uh, you know, at the local level, people participate in the administration, the top levels are always uh, appointed by the center, of course. So there is also sort of structural domination in that sense as well. Thank you. It's interesting too, if I could just add very quickly that I, I was thinking about this quite recently. I made a trip to Thessaloniki in um, the fall and was looking with some, some um, people at the refugee settlement area right outside the wall that was put into place in the 1920s when people would build these shacks against the outside of the wall with, who were being resettled from Anatolia. And that this became a communist neighborhood. Um, that this was, you know, this was actually, <laughs> it's it's what you were saying, saying Jay, about about the kind of appeal of communism among um, among displaced people, and I think that's very interesting, right? Because it suggests that there are ways in which this project of national incorporation was radically unsatisfactory, even to those who did have the kind of promise of eventual integration, right? So there is this desire to think about alternatives, to think about other forms of, you know, internationalisms, other forms of non-national political organizing that I think is a very powerful, um, you know, it's a very powerful impulse that we can see kind of in all sorts of communities. And it's worth taking that seriously as well, that these, these national, these projects of national incorporation um, are often not the ones that people become emotionally attached to. Um, and and we, we should think about why, why that is. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and uh, to Professor Winter, and then we have one question uh, for, from the pan, uh, from the party, one one of our participants who wish to. So yeah, uh, uh, yes, Professor. I, would, I have already spoken. Why don't you let the other question, please? I'll I'll, I'll come later. I, I, we may be thinking along the same lines. I'm not sure, please, uh, please. Professor Winner, but uh, Laura, I, I wonder if I could just draw you just uh, briefly about what does this mean for children and the elderly? Because once we begin to focus on labor, that privileges certain ages, that certain bodies. Um, and I, I was really thinking like, you know, in your earlier formulation, if the idea was to have rural labor, well, maybe you could bring grandma and the kids because the family might work the land. But when we switch to this other kind of labor that you talked about uh, um, in, the, in the, the more recent period, I think it privilege it, it, it actually may work against children and, and the, particularly the elderly. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting question because actually the the league itself, these employment offices that it ran, tested people for medical conditions as well. So we could add kind of you know disability to the list of of kind of questions at stake here, right? In terms of this incorporation, and it suggests further that radical limitations on whatever form of integration this might represent that it's only for certain bodies for certain populations. Um, so yes, there is a an effort to resettle children. I mean, that is that is actually an active part of the early refugee offices, um, both Russian children and then um, Anatolian Greek children. Um, and so, and and they who are seen as kind of laborers of the future, right? That this is this is this is an active active effort to identify them as as future laborers. But there are many other people who are left behind, and this is one of the ways in which. Um, internationalism is the clearing house for saying who is able enough to participate in these projects of employment. I would say too that this is not just a 1920s phenomenon, it also happens after 1945 when the project of clearing out the DP camps after the war cleared out the able-bodied first. And that they, this quote unquote last million, they called them the, the hardcore cases that they could not repatriate or find employment for or do something else with, um, were largely people who were unable to work. And so this this is something, this is a an issue that this particular approach to refugee resettlement never really solved, right? And it did leave substantial numbers of people behind. Um, and in the case of the post-war DPs, you know, there, there's a literature in Israel about the ways in which people were were shipped to Israel and immediately signed up for the IDF to fight in the war without any kind of training. And in some cases, you know, under severe kind of medical um, disadvantage um, and just placed in the front lines. So there are there are very tragic stories that come out of this kind of abandonment of people who were unable to take their place in this employment centered vision for resettlement and citizenship and integration. Thank you for the question, uh, Colin Guy. And uh, uh, so Professor Winter, I uh, wanted to ask the question. Yes, yes. yes. Thank you. I, I ask this in an entirely um, friendly and positive way because after all, this is where we're living now and we all have to deal with it. Put yourself in the position of an aid worker in Gaza who is in the middle of a tragedy uh, in the middle of war crimes, in the middle of terrible things going on. The structure of your argument makes that person have almost no choice about the nature of his work or her work. It, I, what would you advise an aid worker in Gaza now as to how to live within the framework of human capital exploitation, which is, I think, the great strength of your book? But what would be your advice to someone who wants to help Palestinians rebuild? It's such a difficult question. One of the things that makes it so difficult, I think, is that these frameworks of humanitarian aid are the same as frameworks of containment and exploitation yeah. and have a long time, right? And so I think that we have to acknowledge 
we have to acknowledge that reality and suggest that there might be ways of rebuilding that have to bypass some of these internationalist organizations that have had their own sets of interests for such a very, very long time. And that I think we, I think we need to acknowledge have not always benefited refugees, have not always benefited Palestinians, you know, that these are these are institutions of containment as much as they are institutions of relief. So that is not a kind of practical help to somebody <laughs> in the midst. I, I understand that. Um, I'm not sure, but but I think we, I guess what I would say is that I think we need to be having these more theoretical questions about yeah. whether this is the frame through which we should be helping people, right? Absolutely. I, I, I'm not sure about that. I, I can, I think that, you know, UNRWA is a complicated institution with a long and tangled history and, um, you know, its origins are maybe less altruistic than we might like to imagine. Um, and so I think that, you know, perhaps the aid worker needs to think about organizing in other spheres. Um, and I think, and I think that we need to think too about our reflexive assumption that international aid is, you know, a liberal principle and a humanitarian good. I, I am not sure about that. I have come away from writing this book being less and less <laughs> sure about that and not just for Palestine, but, but speaking more generally as well. Thank you. If I may add to that as well, uh, um, actually, again, Bambra is sort of uh, thinks of capitalism as a form of colonization in a, a way. Uh, I mean, what's very interesting is, of course, uh, with modernity, Western European modernity, you do have this sense of uh, capitalism, individualization, and uh, privileging of the urban of, over the rural that I think changes the dynamics of uh, incorporation or exclusion as well, as, as you've pointed out. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, uh, just like, you know, uh, the book uh, Professor Goshek mentioned about Bambra, you know, there is one more book, you know, this is a little, little different, but came did came to my mind when I first came across uh, Human Capital. So this is, this book is by uh, Siddharth Kara, Cobalt Red. I don't know if... Uh, Professor Robson have read it already, but you know, so it it actually deals with the uh, focuses on the Congo and the human rights and uh, environmental catastrophe of you know Congolese workers in cobalt mines. So you know, uh, Kara interestingly mentions uh, particularly that you know world's population uh, in a you know is uh, participating in a human rights and environmental uh, you know catastrophe just for their daily lives because in you know exchange of you know the the cobalt mines they get lithium batteries uh, the you know the congo is the world's uh, largest producer of lithium batteries so you know the important question is that you know so this is just an ecosystem which you know he mentions and you know one more thing which comes to my mind like survival of the fittest you know uh, in this thing uh, I, uh, so i don't know if you have read this book already but you know this book did come to my mind since uh, we discussed more on history. This is a, a lot related to the, you know, uh, uh, con uh, concurrent times. And I would like to know how you view this, you know, this, uh, you know, this modern form of slavery and this ecosystem, which is like, yeah. Do, do you mind putting the reference in the chat? Uh, because I couldn't get the name. Uh... Definitely, definitely. I will, I will. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to see that as well. I I don't think I know that book, um, but it sounds I'd like to look at it. So that would be that would be terrific. I mean, I, yes, I think that you know one of the things that I think comes out of this this conversation about refugees is that people have the idea that refugees are a kind of protected class of migrant, right? And there are some ways in which theoretically and legally that is true. In practice it's a virtually meaningless distinction for a vast majority of people who come up against these systems of asylum and migration. And so I think that one of the things that we can do, you know, one of the things, not having looked at this particular text yet, um, but I would suggest that there are some really fruitful avenues of inquiry that bring together questions of um, migrant labor and histories of migrant labor with, with histories of refugees, because there are many ways in which their circumstances, their outcomes are, profoundly similar and maybe in 
distinguishable. Um, and that, you know, those those histories have things to tell each other that would break down some of these platitudes that are essentially discursive about the kinds of rights that refugees are supposed to have, um, but mostly don't, and the kinds of rights that migrants have never had um, under international law. Mm. So that's very interesting, and I'll look forward to, to reading it. Definitely, definitely. And uh, so with this, we are at the end of our session, and we just couldn't have a, we couldn't keep a track of hours, you know, like how it passed, but it was really an uh, uh, enriching session, and it was wonderful having all of you. And thank you so much, Professor Robson, for, you know, coming up with this interesting book and presenting your, you know, thought-provoking work. Wonderful. Further, uh, it was an excellent exchange. Uh, of thoughts and wonderful discussion between, you know, uh, and highlights between, you know, Professor uh, Fatma Goshek, uh, Robert Hayden and Jay Winter. So to all our viewers and, you know, participants, I would like to request that uh, all of you should read uh, Professor Laura Robson's Human Capital and further also follow our initiative, you know, statelesshistories.org and which is an excellent, you know, initiative on digital uh, humanities and documentation of you know stateless and refugee issues and other various displacement issues some excellent works which uh, she and her team is doing currently so thanks once again for this wonderful evening and thank you all for joining us thank you thank you so